Hello and welcome to another virtual program with Maine Historical Society. I'm Kathleen Newman and it is August 18th, 2022. And this is here and everywhere else, small town Maine and the world uh, with Andrew Whitmer. Andrew is, the, is an associate professor at James Madison University and he's here tonight to talk with us about his first book. Thank you so much for being here, Andrew. Thank you, Kathleen, and thanks to the Maine Historical Society and everyone who's joining us this evening. I'm delighted to be with you. I'm gonna share my screen. I wanna begin by saying how grateful I am for the Maine Historical Society and the work that you do preserving and presenting Maine's history and connecting people who care about it. I have researched in your collections. I've accessed the Maine Memory Network many times. I've watched your online presentations, an excellent talk by Kate McMahon comes to mind, and I've had students in my classes watch your programs. So it's an honor for me to join you to talk about my book. And as we'll see in a few minutes, my single best and most illuminating source came from the collections of the Maine Historical Society. I set out in this book to ask large questions in a small place. So here's my plan for this evening. I'll first introduce the small place, then introduce the large questions, and then share some of my answers to those questions with time at the end for comments and questions. First, here's the place that I studied. And I'll show you several views. This is a photograph taken in 2020. Here's a drawing and lithograph produced in 1889. And here are street level photographs from 2012 and 2017. As these images show, this is definitely a small place. In fact, in its 200 year history, this town's highest census count was 1,243 residents. That was back in 1910. The 2020 census recorded 609 residents. Some of you may know already that I'm talking about the town of Monson in Piscataquis County in central Maine. Monson is located roughly 50 miles northwest of Bangor and about 13 miles south of Moosehead Lake. This map that I'm displaying was published around 1820 and that was actually two years before Monson was incorporated. In 1820, Euro-Americans were still new to central Maine as permanent inhabitants. And this map maker, you may notice, didn't know very much about Moosehead Lake. There's a note included at the top of this map. A very extensive lake has been discovered here but the map maker hasn't included much information about that lake or drawn very much of it. Now, what large questions might one ask in this small and remote place? Some of my questions were quite practical. Why would anyone voluntarily decide to settle in rural central Maine in the 1820s when Monson was founded. It's cold there, the growing season is short, and it was a long way from urban markets. Given these daunting challenges, what did it take to build a town in rural central Maine? And then what did it take to keep it alive for 200 years? Not every town has survived. Why didn't Monson fail 
like the nearby settlement of Wilson, which was bypassed by a new highway in the 1830s and eventually vanished. I wanted to see the world as I set out writing this book as Monson people saw it at the time. And this actually meant not viewing this history through the lens of the present. We hear often in our day about the losses and the struggles faced by rural America. And there's no doubt those losses and struggles are real, but I didn't want my knowledge of this present to distort my view of the past. For most of the period that I studied in this book, rural Americans were actually quite optimistic about the future of rural places. And rural Americans were adept at selectively incorporating the elements of modern life that they thought would benefit them. This photograph of Monson's main street shows that residents kept using horses even after they started using cars, for decades, in fact. We might see a scene like this, black and white photograph, horses, and think of it as old fashioned. But actually this photograph is filled with signs of modern progress in a rural place, not just the car, but the utility poles and the electric street lamps of which Monson people were very proud. So what were rural people thinking and doing as the world changed? They were acted upon, yes, but how were they acting and participating in and even advancing these changes. Finally, I brought questions with me from my previous historical research and writing. I've long been interested in how Americans related to the wider world. So I was curious about how the people in this place did that. What relationships did they form between local, regional, national, and even global activities and identities. What did local mean for the people who lived here? And how did its meaning change over time? Those are some large questions for a very small place. It took me longer to ask them just now than it takes to drive your car or ride your horse the length of Monson's Main Street. Before I share some of my answers, I want to address another question that a few of you might be asking. Why write an entire book about such a tiny town? I've already begun to answer that question by explaining that I think it's possible to tackle big questions of widespread interest through close focus on a small place. Another answer to the question is that Monson's history sheds light on the histories of many rural communities. Monson is obviously a less influential place than Portland or Boston. And no doubt far more people have lived in Boston than have lived in Monson. But for much of the two centuries that I studied in this book, more Americans lived in places like Monson than in places like Boston. For example, in 1900, only 11% of Americans lived in cities with more than 500,000 residents, while around 60% lived in small towns or other rural places. There's obviously a lot of variation between rural places, but there are many commonalities as well. My book tells the stories of people like Seth Stewart, 
a Civil War veteran who returned to Monson and painted houses and then learned to paint landscapes and eventually made part of his living selling paintings of local scenes on canoe paddles or on canvases to local people and also to vacationing urbanites who began to arrive in the main countryside. The book tells the story of the Davis family who made their living selling spruce gum from central Maine all over the United States, even shipped some internationally. In the spirit of hands-on research, my kids and I sampled some spruce gum. I thought it was tolerable. The kids thought it was dreadful. The book also tells the story of Pat and Keith Shaw, who made their living welcoming thousands of Appalachian trail hikers into their home, a famous stop on the Appalachian Trail. And the book tells many other stories, stories of people whose experiences resonate far beyond Bonson. For me, one more reason to study Monson is that it's a community I cared about and wanted to know better. I grew up in Monson and my parents still live there. There's an unfortunate divide between academic history, the kind of history produced by university professors and locally authored local history. It's a long tradition in rural America of locally authored local history. I really wanted this book to speak across that divide between academic history and locally authored local history. And I thought it made sense to try this in a place that I knew personally and in a place where I was known. Having studied this 1889 lithograph of Monson, I can tell you about the artist who produced it, George E. Norris, and the history of bird's eye views of communities during this period. They were enormously popular in part as a way of distinguishing your community and setting it apart from others. But when I look at this scene, I also see the lake where I learned to swim the church that my father pastored, and the hill where my parents now live. It affects your relationship to the history that you're studying when you're working through a stack of old photographs. And one of them is of the house where you grew up. Here it is. I know every inch of this house. The tree that you see in the foreground of this photo was still there, but much larger by the time I came along. Sadly, the pony was gone by then. It changes how you write about a place when you know many of the people who live there and expect that some of them will read what you've written. There should be many more conversations between academic historians and rural communities. Both groups, I believe, will benefit through this dialogue. And I very much appreciate the Maine Historical Society's role in facilitating exactly these kinds of conversations. Bridging this divide in this book project has been a challenge at times, but it's also been far more rewarding than I even anticipated. I published the book with an academic press, the University of Massachusetts Press, the university where I'm on faculty, James Madison University in Harrisonburg, Virginia, supported my research, and scholars are reviewing and engaging with my findings. I also worked closely from the very outset of the project with the all-volunteer Monson Historical Society, right on Main Street, whose leaders provided more sources and insights than I could count. I'm deeply grateful for that. And who hosted a terrific book launch in July. I'm so pleased 
that Monson people shaped this book in myriad ways and that Monson people are reading it. I'll spend the rest of my time discussing some of the answers that I found to those big questions that I mentioned earlier about community formation, local identity, and rural agency. Monson was founded in 1822 by people from Massachusetts and Southern Maine who moved north onto Wabanaki lands. This 1820 document shows Monson and other new townships in what would become Piscataquis County. Euro-American settlement of this area after 1799 benefited land-hungry farmers, people who wanted to own their own land, couldn't obtain it elsewhere, and were willing to move to a difficult place in order to get it and to be independent, freeholding farmers. It also profited educational institutions like Hebron Academy, Monson Academy, Bowdoin College, and Williams College, all shown here, that sold these newcomers lands that these schools had been granted by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. All of these lands belonged to the Penobscots. In 1813, Penobscots complained in a petition to the Massachusetts legislature about how many people were illegally settling on their lands along the Piscataquis River. Penobscots won permission from the Massachusetts legislature to lease their lands, and they even managed to persuade 10 settlers along the Piscataquis to sign and pay. But many more settlers, including the first who came to Monson, followed the common practice in Maine of ignoring Penobscot claims and squatting on their lands. This put great pressure on the Penobscots, leading them to sign away most of their lands in 1818. Local participation in Penobscot dispossession didn't end there. It continued in the stories that people told about their communities. So here are two excellent books that examine the role of local history and history telling, history keeping in justifying dispossession of, among other groups, Native Americans. Historian Jean O'Brien found that hundreds of local histories in 19th century New England engaged in what she calls firsting. This was the common move of ignoring Native American history and writing as if meaningful activity began only when Euro-Americans arrived. Historians have also analyzed how small town past keepers used what Michael Batinsky calls habits of forgetting to forge their community identities. Settlers and their descendants silenced and ignored rival stories about community origins. And this was the case I found in Piscataquis County, where the leading local history, a very valuable work that I used, published in 1880 and cited widely locally ever since, this work excused dispossession, not by challenging Penobscot land claims, but by simply not mentioning them. Maps often did the same thing. Maps could be another tool for writing Indians out of existence, to quote Gene O'Brien. The habits of forgetting, Michael Batinsky's phrase, also obscured the clear ties that linked Monson's farming economy before the Civil War to slavery's prosperity. Slavery seems a long way away from rural central Maine. But Monson farmers profited by selling their farm goods to Moosehead Lake loggers. Central Maine's logs 
fed the state's booming coastal shipbuilding industry. And Maine's ships were in demand for carrying Southern slave produced cotton across the Atlantic to English textile mills. So slavery's prosperity reached even as far as rural central Maine. Findings like these demonstrate that Monson's history was tied to larger histories. I soon saw that tracing the paths into and out of this little rural community could unearth local stories, yes, but also regional, national, and global stories and the connections between them. Hence the book's subtitle, Small Town Maine and the World. I found in my research that Monson people actively, ingeniously, sometimes against great odds, created and sustained their place. That's not a simple task. It's a remarkable achievement, actually. And I argue in the book that Monson people have almost always accomplished it by creatively forging ties with the world beyond the town. They wove the fabric of locality and place, what constituted here, by drawing together materials from everywhere else, hence the book's title, Here and Everywhere Else. And I mean for this title to challenge the view that local history focuses only on what's nearby. This is the narrow frame used by many local histories. But I think this approach rests on a misunderstanding of local and of how places like Monson are made and sustained. So my aim in this book was to write what I call expansive local history. I had the opportunity to work with the talented Maine mapmaker, Kate Blackmer, to create two maps for the book. The first map focuses on the village and the locations mentioned in the book. In the second map, which is actually three maps, a triptych, we tried to visualize the concept of place as meeting place by showing the regional, national, and global contexts of locality in Monson. The scale of the first map is how most people think about local history, but it can't stand alone. In my understanding of local, one needs the second map, one needs that broader context. So the book explores these kinds of dynamics across Monson's history, examining the town's participation in the Civil War, the First World War, examining the arrival of rural immigrants, looking at Monson's relationship with artists and the arts, exploring the routing of the Appalachian Trail through the Monson area, actually right through town in the 1930s and how it changed the town. That's a fascinating story that involves both Monson people and outsiders like a Broadway actor and a Washington DC attorney. The book looks at efforts to build the local economy by harnessing developments like industrialization and urbanization. I'll focus on the single most exciting source that I found, which is held by the Maine Historical Society. This was a full year's run from June 1885 to June 1886 of the Monson Weekly Slate, the only newspaper in Monson's history. This is the inaugural issue, and I'm grateful to research and manuscript librarian Tiffany Link for help getting the digital copy of the weekly slate that I read over and over and over again as I worked on this book. The weekly slate was printed in Bangor, so about 50 miles away, a small city, but it was filled with local news from Monson. 
And this paper offers a remarkable window into daily life at a pivotal time in Monson's history, the mid 1880s. So what was happening in Monson in the mid 1880s? I'll answer that question with another question. What are these men preparing to do? Well, they're getting ready to commute to work. They'll descend 100 feet or more into one of Monson's slave quarries, which became the leading local industry after 1870. This was highly dangerous work, and there are many stories in the slate of gruesome accidents and injuries suffered by quarry workers. How did farmers and shopkeepers know how to quarry slate? Well, they didn't really. So they turned to immigrants with expertise in slate quarry, people from Wales, Sweden, and Finland. Rural immigrants who soon made Monson a remarkably diverse place for such a small community. This book tells the story of Nellie and John Johnson and their family, immigrants from Sweden, shown here, who moved to Monson and never left. John Johnson actually fell to his death in one of the massive pits that he and other quarry workers had created. I knew Nellie and John Johnson's daughter, Esther, whom you see in the center of this photograph as a little girl, when Esther was very old and I was very young. In 1890, immigrants built this Swedish Lutheran church that still stands in Monson. During the same period, Monson residents also worked with outside investors from Massachusetts to expand the slate quarries, to bring a railway into town in the 1880s, and even to build a hotel that catered to city folks venturing into the countryside to take the air and enjoy a vacation. These were major changes. Monson had been a quiet farming community now it was participating in Gilded Age industrialization. As its population grew and changed, the sounds of new languages and the smells of new foods filled the air. Immigrant groups also introduced popular new pastimes like kick sledding. One of the features I discovered of rural immigration was the ability of relatively small groups of newcomers to quickly and dramatically alter a place. Monson had 604 residents in 1870, and only one of them was born outside the United States. 1870, the year that slate production got going in Monson, 604 residents, only one foreign born resident. By 1900, 30 years later, there were 249 foreign-born residents. That might not sound like a lot, 249. Likely no one would have noticed that number in Boston or Portland or New York City. But it's different in a town of about 1,100 people, which was Monson's population in 1900. Suddenly, within three decades, immigrants composed 22.3% of the population. That's even higher than in Portland, Maine's largest city, where less than 21% of residents were foreign born. Now you might expect this sort of rapid and highly visible change in a small town to create an anti-immigrant backlash nativism. 
And you would be right if we were discussing some other nearby towns. The Ku Klux Klan was strong in Maine in the 19 teens and the 1920s. And it was active in nearby Milo, Brownville, and Dexter. This was not the case in Monson, which had its share of casual racism and showed some general concerns about immigration, but actually tended to welcome its immigrant population. And if anyone's interested, I can talk more in the Q&A about why I think this was the case. This is the expansive local world that I was able to discover in the pages of the Weekly Slate. And actually the newspaper itself is a revealing part of that story. The editor was a Monson lawyer named John Francis Sprague. Sprague was a remarkable person and I could talk about him for a long time. He grew up poor and uneducated. He suffered from a deformity of his feet that made walking difficult and very painful, even with a cane. Yet he turned himself into an influential lawyer, state legislator, conservationist, historian, author, and newspaper editor. In June 1885, John Francis Sprague teamed up with a printing firm from Bangor that was trying to drum up more business by establishing a line of locally edited small town newspapers in Bangor's hinterland. Monson was too small to support an independent newspaper. So this Bangor city-based syndicate was the best way for the people of Monson to get a local paper. And I placed local in quotation marks because the question of whether it really was a local paper soon became the subject of much dispute in Piscataquis County. The weekly slate combined town and Piscataquis County news and ads with news and ads literature from Bangor, Portland, Boston, and other cities. As immigrants became more vital within Monson's local economy, the slate started running Swedish language advertisements. Read alongside other sources, the paper shows local people debating the meaning of local. What does local actually mean? This was particularly clear to me as I read and laughed at a long running spat between the weekly slate and the Piscataquis Observer. For decades, the Piscataquis Observer had been the only newspaper in the county. And the family that ran it did not appreciate the new competition for newspaper ads and printing jobs from this Bangor printing firm behind the slate. The editor of the Piscataquis Observer called for local readers to reject this non-local interloper competitor. The observer said that the slate, quote, can hardly be called a local institution inasmuch as it is owned by foreign capital and is wholly printed outside of Piscataquis County. So it's presenting the slate as a dangerous foreign influence in Piscataquis County. This sparked um, a vigorous back and forth and reading that exchange over a number of issues reveals that John Francis Sprague also saw himself as a champion of the local, but that he saw local very differently than the editor of The Observer did as revealed in the pieces that he wrote. For Sprague, a newspaper printed in Bangor was not a foreign threat to his place, but a new resource for enhancing Monson and promoting Monson. He saw all kinds of ways that a newspaper could be used to let other people know what was going on in town, to 
print local news of interest to Monson people who were still living in Monson, and importantly to Monson people who had moved away, because many had, really from the first few decades of Monson's existence, people began to struggle with the challenge of keeping young people local. So there was a Monson diaspora and the slate agreed to send free copies of the newspaper to people from Monson who were living elsewhere. Those people started to write into the slate. They started to share their stories and then to read the stories of their childhood friends and academy classmates and to reconnect in this early form of social media. So John Francis Sprague was excited about the placemaking possibilities of print. That's part of why he wanted to edit this newspaper. He saw closer links with Bangor, not as undermining local independence, but as bolstering Monson's place in the county. And he used the paper as part of his campaign to make Monson an economic and cultural hub for nearby towns. What this all adds up to, I think, is that John Francis Sprague and the Weekly Slate advanced a conception of a local that didn't require isolation, didn't require self-sufficiency, but rather required the ability to channel outside flows of capital and culture. It was okay that they were coming from outside as long as local people retained the ability to channel them in the interests of their community. I found that this was quite similar, this understanding of place was quite similar to what one scholar calls an extroverted sense of place. Monson, John Francis Sprague, the Weekly Slate were creating locality by combining near and distant materials. In the last chapter of the book, I examined the 20th century and Monson's story continued to be wrapped up with global developments as the slate industry faded, jobs disappeared, the slate quarries adjusted by focusing on mill stock. In other words, not just roofing slate, but slate worked into various products. Monson's interaction with the world continued later in the 20th century as the town went into decline. By that time, the main employer was a furniture mill and it closed because it couldn't compete with Chinese furniture manufacturers. The challenge emerged in 2000 and it worsened so quickly that the mill closed in 2007. Soon the elementary school closed. These are heartaches, the loss of a mill in a mill town, the closing of a school, that are common in rural parts of America. But this story has a surprising twist, and this is where I will end my talk. In 2016, the philanthropic Libra Foundation, which is based in Portland, began working with local people to revive Monson. Monson had attracted some very talented even world famous artists over the years. Carl Springhorn, Swedish American artist, Alan Bray, Bernie Sabat, the photographer. The town had also built a reputation for welcoming newcomers, whether they were Swedish, Finnish, Welsh immigrants or Appalachian trail hikers. The Libra Foundation decided to build on that history. In an effort to catalyze economic recovery in Monson and in Piscataquis County, the Libra Foundation has spent millions of dollars to purchase and renovate many buildings and to establish Monson Arts, which runs educational and residency programs for artists. These programs bring students, artists, and art lovers into Monson. And this ongoing experiment in creative placemaking has drawn attention from the Boston Globe and the New York Times. This means that as Monson marks its bicentennial this year, townspeople 
find themselves once again deciding how to weave the outside world into their place. That concludes my remarks. If anyone would like to contact me, here's the best way to do that. And I believe we now have some time for comments and questions. Yes, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, thank you so much, Andrew. That was really great. Um, really interesting stuff. And the audience definitely has questions. Do you know of any other counties in Maine where slate and or quarries were important to the local economy? Slate was very important in other parts of Piscataquis County. So there's a very rich vein that runs through Piscataquis County and slate was quarried in Brownville well before it was quarried in Maine. Uh, the production of slate is actually a really interesting example of my argument in the book about here and everywhere else. Growing up in Monson, I heard many times that slate was discovered in Monson in 1870. So I was surprised as I researched the book to find that some of the earliest settlers were well aware of the presence of slate. They used it to construct a chimney, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, there were people in other parts of Piscataquis County who were aware of Monson's slate deposits. Um, there was a group of surveyors for the state who came through Monson in the 1860s, so you know, years before 1870, and said, there's a lot of slate here, and it would actually very likely be commercially profitable to quarry slate. So why this matters is that it really wasn't that slate was discovered in 1870. That's, that's a story of slate's origins in Monson that focuses on what's only happening nearby. What really happened is that there were broader changes internationally and nationally that made it possible to profitably quarry slate in a, a remote rural place. Uh, things like the immigration of Welsh slate quarriers into the United States, things like the expansion of America's rail network. So now you could actually get this heavy rock to urban markets. Uh, even things like changing architectural styles. You know, so the roof pitches of Gothic revival houses were steeper and this worked better with slate. It also meant that roofs were more visible. So it was worth paying a little extra to have something beautiful on your roof. Interesting. Uh, someone else is asking, what do you consider the root cause or causes of the region's inability to sustain um, or develop a sustainable industry or evolve its legacy in slate mining, forestry, manufacture, tourism, any of those things? Those are really important questions. And I think anyone from this part of Maine feels the weight of those questions. Some of what I discovered in the book is that the experiences that I observed growing up of young people, including myself, moving away to get an education and find work were not 20th century developments. It, this was the case from, as I said earlier, the first decades of Monson's history. And so at the 50th anniversary celebration in 1872, one of the speakers said, it's really hard to watch our young people moving away. Maybe the fact that we've just discovered slate will help. You know, Maybe if we can develop an industry, there'll be a reason for young people to stay. They can find work here. And in fact, that's what people were saying in the 1880s. I found a, a letter in the slate from a young man who had moved away. And he said, I visited Monson recently and I couldn't believe what I saw. If this had been the case a decade or so ago, then maybe I and my classmates would have stayed local. So these are, these are painful problems for a small yeah. place that, that wants to keep its own people local. And I think the, the problems are many. Um, I'm very impressed with the resilience and the resourcefulness of small town people in Maine who figure out how to transition from one solution to this problem to another. Um, and 
And so I saw that happening in Monson where the slate industry, roofing slate was um, waning because of the invention of asphalt shingles. Monson people transitioned to mill stock. The slate industry fell on hard times in the 1930s and the invention of plastic made it much harder to sell slate. So after the slate quarries declined, Monson people persuaded some outsiders to come in and start a furniture mill, Moosehead Manufacturing. And as I explained, Moosehead Manufacturing ran into trouble with foreign competition. And Monson people have uh, found this wonderful relationship with the Libra Foundation that promises new growth for the town. Um, I think the, the problems are many um, and they have to do with, um, in some cases, just the lack of um, resources, um, competition from other places. Um, these are well-known problems, but uh, I'm hopeful that rural people in Monson are, are figuring out how to deal with them. A couple people are asking about um, like other small towns, like the differences between them and Monson. Do you, um, you know, that someone's saying, what did small towns that you mentioned um, that, that like didn't make it, why did they fail? Or do you have examples of other places in the area of similar size and population that have gone through like those similar boom and bust uh, cycles? Yeah, that's a great question. I really like that. Um, I did study many other towns as I wrote this book. Um, Monson existed within an ecosystem of small towns. Mm. And so in its early years, it was heavily dependent on nearby communities like Sangerville and Guilford. Monson people walked to these places initially to pick up the mail or to go to a mill before they built their own. Um, and so I'm, I'm very interested in how small town life in the 1820s and even today uh, operates not independently, mm -hmm. but as part of a larger group of towns. Sure. Um, and, and this means that struggles in one town will affect people in another town. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if Guilford uh, loses an industry, people who work in Monson and drive to Guilford will, will struggle or people who live in Monson and, and work in that mill right. are going to fall on hard times. Um, it also means that economic growth has to be thought of at the regional level. And I think this is one of the things that the Libra Foundation has done very well. They're not just focused on Monson. They're also investing in Greenville and in Dover Foxcroft mm -hmm. and in other towns in the county, recognizing that you know if you put in um, an ice rink in Dover, people are going to drive there from Greenville or Bangor. And if you invest in Monson, this will have ripple effects across the county. Yeah. One more question from the audience. Do you know why the KKK was less active in Monson? Does it have anything to do with, you know, you mentioned there's a, a lot of immigrants living there. Did it have anything to do with where they were coming from or their religious leanings? Why doesn't it gain any kind of foothold in that town? Yeah, uh, I think that's exactly right. So as I mentioned, you know, reading through the, the newspaper, um, I've found that racism affected lots of people and it wasn't a town that was immune from the nativism and the racism of the period. Sure. But, the immigrants who were coming to Monson tended to be Northern Europeans and Protestants. Mm -hmm. And this, I think, is the key explanation. The, the Klan in Maine in the 19 teens and 1920s uh, was largely concerned about Catholics mm -hmm. and about Franco Americans. Yeah. And so, in some of those other communities that I mentioned, uh, those were the immigrants who predominated. And Monson immigrants from Sweden, Finland, and Wales tended to be very interested in assimilating, mm -hmm. you know, learned uh, English fairly quickly mm -hmm. in most cases, entered Monson Academy, and even went on to become teachers in Monson Academy, joined up and fought in large numbers mm -hmm. in World War I, especially the children of immigrants. Um, and so these were all ways in which Monson's immigrants signaled we want to become Americans sure, sure. And, uh, and gained a welcome for themselves in the town. Thank you. So what's next for you? 
This is your first book. Um, really interesting, really interesting stuff. And folks, you can purchase your copy uh, at Maine Historical Society or through our museum store online. So visit mainehistorystore.com or come visit us in person at 489 Congress Street in Portland. The store is open Tuesday through Saturday. Um, what, you know, any other new projects or yeah. books in the works for you? Yeah, thanks for asking, Kathleen. Um, I have a couple projects in the works. Um, actually, the first thing I'm doing is teaching courses this coming semester, and I'll, I'll be teaching a graduate level course in local history that comes right out of this project. That's great. I've got a couple book projects going, and they're still in the early stages, so I can't say much about them yet, but both are focused on locality, placemaking, and uh, rural America uh, coming right out of the work that I've done for this book project. Right. Well, we'll really, we'll be interested to hear more about those, you know, as they take, as they take shape. Thank you so much uh, for being here with us this evening. Uh, and thank you to all the folks in our audience and uh, hope we'll see everybody back here real soon. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you.